the team stay? Can you guys all say team stay on three? One, two, three. Hey guys, Nick Gonzalez here. Um, I am a former president of HOSA. HOSA is, stands for Health Occupational Students of America. And basically it's a class, um, academy class at your school or at a different school if you travel from another school that where you go and learn the basics of kind of the medical field and get a better understanding to see if you want to pursue farther in college and or careers. What do you learn in HOSA? So basically you learn the essentials of what uh, kind of a nurse does. Uh, it takes blood pressure, it takes vitals. Um, we also learn how to use a tourniquet, stop the bleed it's called. And we also learn CPR and we are CPR certified after that class. Wow, that's great. So Nick, in school, do you invite medical professionals to come to your classes? Yes, we actually do. I invited one myself, uh, she was a uh, orthopedic and she came in, showed us all the cool stuff she's been through and all the cool experience and certifications she's, she's gone through and all the schooling and it was a great experience. Uh, fellow, or a few of my classmates have also done that too and brought in their uh, family friends that are nurses, doctors, and it's awesome. So that's what HOSA classes do? They invite medical professionals down? Why is that? To get a better under understanding of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and see if we if, see if we like it and want to be in the field. Enough being said about me, let's go talk to the cardiologist and yeah. Hi, I'm Marianne. Welcome to Teen Say. Well, thanks to the Wingate by Wyndham, we are in their conference room because it is Corona COVID time. So we are with Dr. Callahan. Thank you so much for being with us sure. today. Happy to be here. He is a big hero cardiologist, especially during coronavirus. He's going to answer a lot of questions for us later about Corona. But right now, and by the way, we're socially distancing. We want to thank our firefighters too. Our idea before COVID was to have great doctors like yourself that are either in the operating room or in the office do a video with us so the national HOSA organization can show the video. So tell us, when did you decide to become a cardiologist? Was it right away in high school? When did you know? Um, well, I knew from high school that I wanted to go into medicine. Um, and uh, I, I remember saying to a uh, co-student in, in high school that I was going to be a pediatric cardiologist. Wow. Now did I, that was a sophomore year in high school, do I really know what a pediatric cardiologist really was at that time? <laughs> Probably not. So where did you get that? Um, had a cousin that had congenital heart disease, so I knew, uh -huh. there was a, I knew there was a specialty. I enjoyed working with kids and um, I felt I was probably going to go into pediatrics and, and car the cardiology aspect of it seemed to interest me. Was when I was in uh, sixth grade, I saw a, a movie about an open heart surgery and that really kind of... Where did you see that movie? It was in uh, science class in sixth grade. It was wow. one of those Nova, you know, PBS Nova um, shows that one, one of my teachers showed. It was open heart surgery. I was very enthralled by it. A lot of my other fellow students were grossed out or <laughs> I kind of I thought this is for me. Yeah. And at some point, I, I thought maybe going into uh, cardiovascular surgery. Wow. Yeah, I thought I was going to pass out. I went to the Dome at Inova, um, okay. and we went with um, their HOSA class to, uh, to see open heart surgery. And I said to the teacher, who was an RN, uh, I don't know, you know, and she said, I have smelling salt for those mm -hmm. that pass out. But she was so professional um, doing her lesson that even though this person was on the table having heart surgery we were very calm and we were looking but yet we were looking almost like it was a specimen like it wasn't a person it was the way she handled the class the, well, it almost the doesn't students. seem it almost doesn't seem real when you see it when the patient's all draped and you just see a blue drape with a hole in the middle and you see a heart so it kind of right. takes away the the personality of the patient 
and some people are able to separate from that and not really look at it as being a person. So how do you do that with children? Well, I just know we have um, you know, great surgeons that uh, we can trust are going to do what we uh, wish for them to do and to uh, our surgeons look at each patient individually. Uh, it's not a diagnosis and you have a plan. It's a, it's a individual patient who has a diagnosis that is different from another patient that has that diagnosis and we go in with a plan mm -hmm. and um, you know as long as it's carried out well uh, in a fairly quick manner that needs to be in order to preserve the heart, preserve the brain uh, function, then you know we're happy with the outcome. We get good outcomes. We know that we've had good outcomes in the past, and we trust that if everything goes well, we can this time. And there are times where um, where children are um, have a, have a bad outcome, and that's that's hard. And I think it's a hard profession. Um, and uh, but it's it's challenging and it's very rewarding. So so how did you decide pediatric cardiology? You just was it wasn't through your internships at the hospital? Well, I did um, I did my uh, third year rotations, and I really liked. Uh, internal medicine, and I really liked adult cardiology. Um, and uh, <laughs> I've heard I've heard so many jokes about that from kids. No, we don't want to do the adults. The <laughs> it's terrible what they say. They're like they're already high blood pressure, too fat. Well, and just <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> there, there are there are only a, you know there's there's a few diseases that you take care of in adult cardiology. There's some of some of them are surgical, and a lot of them are high blood pressure and and OB, you know you work with the your internal medicine docs and, and help take care of adults a lot of its rhythm rhythm and um, functional heart disease mm -hmm. uh, for people with, or people with coronary artery disease um, with kids you know we diagnose them prenatally so I, I one of my specialties is actually doing fetal echo wow. uh, where I diagnose the heart condition before they're born, usually at about 20 weeks gestation. So I get, you know, so, so some of the 17 year olds that I take care of now, I've known for almost 18 years, even wow. though they're only 17. So you'll get a call after their sonogram that there is a problem. Correct, okay. or they suspect a problem. And, and oh, we, okay. uh, we will do an ultrasound and, and see that. So, so I get to follow these patients from then to graduating high school and college. Wow. Um, and sometimes get invited to their graduations, get invited to their weddings, that sort of thing. And that's very rewarding that you're bringing, you're bringing up a child who's going to then go into adult life and have a normal quality of life. Where some of these kids, 30 years ago, would have been, the parents would have been given the, the words that there's nothing we can do. Mm. So, and, and sometimes, you know, there are, there are congenital heart defects that we take care of where um, even with surgery, the, the best survival might be six or seven years yeah. or less. Wow. Uh, and then there are other conditions where we don't know what adult, li adult life is going to be for them because we only have kids who are now 32 with, yeah. the, with the successful um, surgical correction and sometimes we're, we don't call it correction because it's we're not we're not making the heart normal mm -hmm. we're making it functional so we call it palliation and when you have a heart condition that is a, a palliation um, everything's not working the way it was designed to in you and me daughters in the medical profession um, does that normally happen um, to a lot of Doctors. Having, having other family members. Yeah, that? follow suit. Well, your I wife, your you, daughter. I think if you meet your wife uh, when you're in your medical career, it's like a lot of other uh, careers where you meet around work. Yes. Uh, that you wind up marrying somebody in the same similar profession. So, uh, 
and then uh, uh, some of your children, that's what they're exposed to, so they kind of go into that. So yes. I have a daughter who's a nurse, a daughter who's not sure what she wants to go into you know, She's right young, now. yes. She's young, and... and uh, She's the same age you were when you decided you wanted to become a doctor, right? She's a sophomore? No, junior. She's a junior in... in yeah. In, or she'll be a senior in high school. Um, can you I believe you knew then... Yeah, they. My kids are, are a little bit disturbed with the fact that they don't know what they want to do, oh. and I was so certain. I'm like, not everyone knows, and I didn't okay. know that I was going to go into that, and my pathway was not clear cut. Uh, That's what we're going to talk to about. To get back into into that aspect, um, you know, I, I went through high school like everyone goes through high school. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed my science curriculum. I was not great at math. I was pretty good at the physics and the chemistry and worked hard at it, I enjoyed it, right. uh, biology and things like that, and thought that, that medicine was for me, uh, so I went. That's, that's why this HOSA class, they didn't have this when you were young, but for kids trying to decide. Yeah, they really had nothing when, you know, yeah. we, we had to talk to uh, friends' parents who were surgeons or physicians to find out what medicine was really like and work in hospitals and things like that to get some exposure. Uh, so, you know, most of us did that. In fact, the it was recommended that people who wanted to go into medicine should have a um, some form of job at the hospital um, in order sense. to expose them. So, as far as your daughter goes, um, I was telling a lot of high school students about um, uh, different careers. You know, and we've gone to. Um, the high schools and showed, you know, the veterinarian classes, the engineering classes, and so forth. We've highlighted those on Teen Set. And, um, you know, we have those up on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. My son, for instance, um, went to HOSA, and um, he thought he wanted to be um, an orthopedic. Right. And then after speaking to them and hearing about how much school they had to go to and various other things, he changed his mind. And... Um, he wanted to do the business side of health. And the teacher's husband was in the business side of health, so she spoke a lot about that. So what's great about HOSA is they talk about all aspects of it. So I guess they can change their mind as they go, too. Nothing's written in stone, it's just a journey. So right. we wanna hear about your journey, and we wanna hear how you feel about them changing their journey as they go along and learn more. Well, I think anyone's journey, everyone's journey is different. Um, I went to a college that was small. Um, a lot of people would go to a larger university, um, and I went to a small university, had a small biology program, a small chemistry program. I started out as a chemistry major. Oh. Um, currently, when kids go to college, they seem to have a lot more introductory to college, like they, they have courses on how to learn and how to study in their in their first year of, of college, which we didn't have. I would have loved they, that. A lot of times they will structure the curriculum such that their first year isn't as hard. Okay, mm -hmm. When I went, there was no emphasis on that. They said, right. go to your, your, in your orientation weekend, go sign up for your classes. Here is yeah. what you're supposed to be taking in your first year as a chemistry major. So it was calculus and chemistry and physics and biology, English and German. It was my first, wow. my first semester. And wow. there was probably, maybe there was a religion somewhere in there because it was a Catholic school. Um, wow. But, um, you know, it was, a, it was a busy first semester. Mm -hmm. um, with, <laughs> with physics, <laughs> you really needed to have calculus, and I didn't have calculus. Now, a lot of the kids who go into maybe go into chemistry now, have had calculus or IB or AP mm -hmm. um, sorts of mathematics in high school that I didn't have or that we didn't have as much. When, when, we, when I was in high school, AP was a college level course and a lot of times these kids would go to the college. You didn't have it at your school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we had regular courses, and then the AP kids were the kids that were maybe better at something or wanted to excel at something, so they took a college-level course, and that was their AP, and they got high school credit for it, but it was college credit for it as well. Right. So 
there are, there are a lot more advantages in some of these bigger high schools now than yeah, sure. we had back then in preparation for being a chemistry major or a engineer. And I think there's, you know, when you go into uh, medicine, when you go into college, your first year of college, some people, their journey is, is fairly rough and they don't do very well. And I didn't do very well in my first semester. Um, and I had to have a reality check and say, is this for me? Would so you say to be, sorry, would you say um, to become a doctor, you have to have a high IQ and be, and really be a disciplined person? You, and have, to, you have to have a high IQ in order to get through the courses, but you also have to have a strong work ethic. Mm -hmm. right? Because, it, you know, you, you can um, get through the courses, uh, but that's not going to make you a good physician. You have to right. work hard at it. Um, I had to work hard at it because my first semester of college yeah, that's what I want to hear was, about was your kind of a semester. disaster. Tell us. Well, I, I didn't have a high cumulative average. Uh, I had okay. kind of a C average at that time. So you, you think about people who go to medical school, oh, you've never failed a course. You've never had lower than an A. Right. Well, there are people who go through a challenge and they have to buckle down and, and get better. And the you know my first semester wasn't great wasn't great. Um, the second semester was better. This <laughs> is at a point where your your advisor may say maybe you should think of something else. Uh, okay. Okay. So the next year I go into organic chemistry, love it, do very well. Um, that's usually the make or break for a lot of people. There were a lot of people in my college who started out pre med, and when they started taking organic chemistry, it filtered from four sections of, of classes in the first semester to two in the second. So right. half of the kids drop out of the whole process. And then after, um, after that year, more people go into business or go into something else or mm -hmm. leave the school entirely and go in a completely different direction. It's, you know, people will change their journey at different paths, okay? The best time to change the journey is before you get too far into it yeah. to make, you know, there's, I tell people, if you, you know, if you go into law school, mm -hmm. I think law school, getting a law degree, there are so many avenues for you to take afterwards. You can practice law, you can, you can work with a business and be, you know, their inside legal yeah. guides. Uh, you can work with a startup. You can, there's a lot of, you, know, you can work in, you know, government, mm -hmm. whatever, wherever it is, there's a lot of things that you can do. With medicine, once you go through medical school and then residency, you're kind of filtered into where you're going to go. You can go into research or you can go into clinical medicine. Right. That's kind of where it is. Now, you can, with leadership and then a business degree and other things, go into other corporations mm -hmm. and learn. As their expert. As a medical person or as a, as a director in, in some aspect of their business. Right. So there are medical people who leave medicine completely and go on into some form of business. So, um, you know, but majority of people who go through medical school go through and become a physician and they, they practice medicine. And, um, and medicine changes all the time. But so... So do they have to get into the best college possible um, before they go to medical school? I think you need to get into a college that's going to give you a well-rounded education in your first four years of, of life as a, as a student. Could they start out in community college? Yeah, I think that's a great avenue for people to go. If they do a, a, a um, NOVA mm -hmm. or some form of community college for two years that then has a program that translates over to a, um, uh, a four-year degree college. Um, there's, as long as you know that the the credits will transfer, then mm -hmm. you'll be fine. I don't know that NOVA teaches um, the courses we were talking about that the four-year schools do. And I know with one of my daughters, mm -hmm. her high school GPA was uh, great when she was super busy, but otherwise it was, it was okay, you know. And all of a sudden, she took the classes that you're referring to. She was 4.0 mm -hmm. every single semester. And this was a kid that all of a sudden started tutoring 
other kids. So those courses really do make a difference. Um, but anyway, so back to Nova. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know. Do you know if they? Well, either way, they, they, they need they to learn. Offer, how, they oh, offer, they do. Yeah, they offer multiple um, courses, and you can, there are kids who come home from from uh, college and. and over the summer take organic chemistry at NOVA. No, 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 I meant the study courses. Like, it's it's important when well, you go no, to college Nova. to know how to study and to know how to well, read back, material. back when I went to college, there was no, it was your father that taught you how to study, your yeah. mother taught you how to study. Um, yeah. And mostly when I went to college, I knew, I learned that I didn't know how to study properly. And, right. um, and so I, I looked at what some of my, you know, friends who were better students than I was, what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I copied some of what they were doing, and then I learned a little bit more. Right. And I got better at it, and I became a better student. But that's, you know, that was my motivation. That was my, my work ethic. I learned my work ethic from my parents um, and, um, and worked hard at it, and, and I had a goal. I uh, achieved my goal, got into medical school uh, right out of college. Uh, I, didn't have a lot of interviews uh, because my GPA wasn't as competitive as I was not a very good standardized test taker. What I'm trying to say is that people shouldn't give up on their dreams if, if it's still possible. Okay, so I agree. And, and, there, and there are, so my dream was to get into medical school. Uh, I was not getting a lot of interviews. What um, does that mean? You weren't getting a lot of interviews? So you're applying to schools. Okay. And then, in order for medical school, you get interviews. Oh. And at least that's the way it was. Okay. I'm sure it probably still is the right. same way now. Um, most uh, graduate wow, programs probably don't interview, but co medical school, um, the interview was a large part of getting in. So wow. your first part was taking the MCAT. Had well, your first part was getting the grades, mm -hmm. and then taking the MCAT and applying, and then you would be offered an interview. And as you're offered an interview, you can wow them or not. Tell us about the MCAT. What is the MCAT? It's like an SAT for medicine. Okay. So it it's tests you in your aptitude in you know, various sciences and writing, things like that. So, uh, so a lot of studying goes into that. It's not like a month. Uh, no. You, you, yeah, there are, there are kids now who will take months to study for it. Yeah. Um, and How long did you take? Just during your junior year I of just college? Had, there was no, there was in, in the town that I was at school, there was no Kaplan uh, class. There was no uh, study guide. There was, wow. you know, you just had a book, how to, you know, prepare for the, the MCAT like you have the SAT books. Right, I was, you, I was thinking you, of that. <laughs> and you did, you did question after question. There was no online anything right. back then. Right, right. So uh, it was before... No great videos Before with great computers, doctors. Before yeah, computers, yeah. there's no, there's nothing. So you had, uh, you had your books and you had your, your Barons how to take the MCAT book, uh, and you had your, uh, you know, you found a isolated place in, in your your room or in the library or in a lab somewhere, and you buckled down and you studied. Or and you outside. Took, <laughs> not usually. No. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, I studied outside by the squirrels. and That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I didn't go to med school. <laughs> but um, <laughs> nice. you know, I, 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 found, I found a nice cold lab uh, because it kept me awake. Oh. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, that's I, I what heard, I did. I heard during medical school some people actually fall asleep in the Cadiva lab while they're studying all night. <laughs> um, you can, probably, if you're tired. <laughs> They said they'd be in not, there so not, long <laughs> that yeah, they'd fall asleep, and I was like, oh, gross. That's probably not that common. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I would say. Mostly you're falling asleep at the library. Gotcha. Or, or in your lab or, or right. wherever um, you are. But um, Back to your journey. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's, <laughs> it's just a, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of hard work, and um, I share my journey just to say that even though I didn't start out with all A's in my first semester or my second semester, mm -hmm. I kept with my my plan. I didn't have a lot of interviews. I had two. Um, I got into one, but I was on the wait list until July 31st when school started in mid-August. Mm 
So I was waiting all summer, but in the meantime, I applied, so talking about a gap year, I applied for a master's degree at University of Buffalo in, oh, okay. in biochemistry or something, immunology, somewhere along that, that line, and, um, and was accepted to the master's program. So I would have done a master's and continued that journey towards medical, because uh, at that time I kind of had blinders on towards medicine. Did you take a break between um, college and then med school? No, there was no such thing back then. Okay. Yeah. They have that, don't they call now that? Now they recommend a, a gap year. And tell us about the gap year. I have no idea what a gap year is. <laughs> but I, what I hear from other, from people who are applying is that they don't like to take people directly out of college. And that, okay. that being said, there are, I have friends whose children are going on to medical school directly from college. Mm -hmm. So they, they're not taking a gap year, but other people are taking a gap year. Maybe they're working on a master's degree, or maybe they're working on working in the field. Maybe they're right. working as a med tech, or maybe they're working, they're getting their EMT and working in an ER. Right. Whatever it is that they do, that, that helps with their commitment towards uh, being a physician if that's, or, or maybe deciding it's not for them. And also, I think the criteria to get into med school is so difficult that uh, some of the med schools, now that I think about it, I think Eastern Medical <coughs> School, they have to have a certain amount of hours, 2,000 hours, before they apply. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I don't, but I don't know what, yeah. again, I don't know what they need. I know what my journey right. was. I don't know, I'm not on the admission council, and I don't know. Right. I think the sad part is um, some of them might get so busy with their job, maybe, you know, if they're working, I don't know, as, a, you know, um, something. <laughs> EMS work, work yeah, in the EMS and, you know, meet someone, get me <laughs> like detour. Well, there, there, yeah. there, there can be detours and there are detours yeah. in life. And so you yeah, have, really you know, have to be determined to go through med committed. school. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the longer you take to get on that track, the harder it may be because you're, you get right. into your adult life. And I, I have right. a I have a daughter that wants to finish, she's a, a senior in college next year. She mm -hmm. wants to go to medical school, but she wants to do two years of Peace Corps first. Wow. So, yeah, that's fine, that's great. Yeah. It, it's gonna broaden her global view yes. of, of, of uh, her career. Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to st strengthen mm -hmm. her desire to be a physician or not. Yeah. It may send her in a totally different direction. True. Okay. So then you go out and you take the MCAT or you take the MCAT before then, mm -hmm. however that uh, happens. And you, um, you know, for me, taking the MCAT was a part of my junior year of college. You know, so I had to study, yeah. I had to study and prepare for that along with taking biochemistry and physiology and, and all these other courses. And kids and complain the about the SATs. No, I'm just kidding. Well, First thing that but, came to mind. <laughs> but it's it's the journey that you take, and everybody, yeah. you know, the journey the journey thirty five years ago was different than it is today. When it comes to journey, I think once you get into medical school and you hit that goal, um, your life, my life, became better in medical school because I was there. There was no more. Um, push to get into medical school. And you don't work during medical school? I didn't work. In there a perfect are, there world. Are people, there are people who may work some, but there's not a lot of time. Yeah. Um, you know, the classes are, are uh, you know, eight, 8 o'clock until, you know, I can't remember exactly, but uh, 2 or 3 in your, in your in the library after that, and then you finish the library and you go to the gym, you get dinner, you go back to the library, um, you go home maybe. Um, your, your tests were, my tests were pretty much around the same time, so your, all of your classes were kind of on the same schedule, so, oh. your, so your exams, you might have had a bunch of exams in one week, yeah. and then you were, you had a week that you could kind of, you know, blow off a little bit, yeah. blow off some steam, so, and everyone was on the same path, so everyone was able to go out and, you know, maybe have a couple drinks, but after that, you're, you're back into... Um, the the grind the grind yeah and wow. um, you know a lot of times you're you're up until uh, one two three o'clock in the morning and then you can't
can't get up for your 8 o'clock class, but you pay for a note service, so that somebody's there recording the class, and they take the wow. notes, and you can take, you know, and then you have to rely on their note-taking their, their note mm -hmm. and the way that they put their notes together. So how, how did you find the adrenaline? How do doctors find the adrenaline during, or med students find that adrenaline when they're there to stick it out during, you know, a week of testing and, and you know, being, like, even the first year? How do they find that adrenaline to be so excited, to be so determined? It, it really has to be... Well, your desire is to get through it. Yeah. Your desire is to win. So, you know, yeah. if you're... If you're you need to have a certain, you know, most of the, I'd say that most kids who were in medical school started my first year of medical school stayed. There were a couple of kids that, that didn't, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of young people that didn't. I don't know if they're kids anymore, but, right. um, but you know, some people didn't finish with us. And um, Well, you see the average, like some college students, you see parents, oh my gosh, I sent, you know, I sent him to school and he's getting C's or D's, he's out at night. I mean, that's not the brain, that's not the mindset of someone in medical school. I Their think we're pretty driven so and focused, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. it's, and, and everyone's doing, you know, your, your friends are the people that you're working with, and they're mm -hmm. all studying. Right. So you're all studying, and you see what they're doing, and, and there's a level of competition, and uh -huh. when, back then, uh, you that's know, they, would, they would post the scores on the wall, Wow. Next to the classroom. So you would go there to look at what your grade was, and everyone else could see what your grade was. Oh. So, <laughs> you know, there's there's that motivation to try to be at the top of the list. Yeah, for sure. You know, so I, you know, I think that's the what, same. Was there a, the same a anyway. free coffee or a prize for the top of the list? No. Just the, just the big hat. <laughs> yeah, just, you know. Just, you, I well, did you, it. You, Yay! You, you, you want to be at the top of the, you want to be at the top of the list because you, yeah, you, you excel. Well. You excel at the material, so and um, you know that's that's primarily it. So um, and the first, so the first two years was was heavy in in the classwork, and the, the last two years was heavy in the hospital. And uh, so it's four years of med school. Four years of med school. Yeah. Okay. Unless you're doing an MD PhD, and then there's research, and it's longer. So tell us about the two years in the hospital after. You're you're kind of functioning like a you're, you're shadowing um, the. Is that when you have your specialty picked? No, yeah, you're, you're oh, going okay. through. So you go through um, eight weeks or twelve weeks of internal medicine. You go through uh, weeks of OBGYN, weeks of uh, general surgery, oh, uh -huh. weeks of orthopedics on elective, or weeks of ophthalmology on elective. So there's all sorts of you go through as you know whatever you can, and you. If you choose some of your electives based upon something that you you might be interested in, mm -hmm. or if you know what you're going to do, you might choose an elective so that you at least get a little exposure to the eye, you know, yeah. ophthalmology. So, um, and or you do uh, you know a few weeks of radiology, you know, you right. get to see everything. So that's your third year. Your your fourth year, gosh, um, the fourth year is is a little bit more fine tuning. You're still doing what you did in your third year and and you're doing your acting internships so you're you're acting more so each year you get into things you're getting to a higher level of responsibility so if you're an acting intern you're mm -hmm. you're essentially acting you're actually your role in mm -hmm. that 6 8 weeks or whatever it is is like you're an intern like okay. you're one of these an intern is your first year of residency okay Okay, um, and that's those are twelve-hour shifts. Well, it's it, it's different than it used to be, and okay. I can't tell you exactly. I mean, every program is a little bit different, but right. they have hours restrictions now yeah. uh, that they didn't have. You can, they, they they cannot work a certain number. They have a cap on the number of hours they can work in thirty-six hours of, of time, mm -hmm. whereas there wasn't that back when I was in school uh, or in residency, um, which has probably made life better. There's a lot more, now there's a lot more education sessions for the residents, at least at, a, at our program. There's a lot more, there's a whole day dedicated to education in the afternoon 
uh, as long as they're getting their, and there's a cap at the number of resident, or number of patients that each of the residents can take. And back when I was in residency, and I'm not trying to say that we were, you know, superheroes back then, but you know, there was no cap back then, so you could have 20 patients that you were taking care of. Now they can have seven or eight, and I don't know the number. I'm just making up that number. Right. Um, but, um, but how yeah. do you feel about the medical TV shows that you see? On TV, you they're, know, they're just not, they're not CME. They're drama. <laughs> they're drama. They're drama. They try to. They try to. So Grey's Anatomy. There's nothing real there. I don't know. I haven't watched it. <laughs> okay. We had the uh, kids all like it. Yeah, we do. it's just the drama that they like. Was, it's when the, I was all in, the, uh, when I was in high school or uh, college, there was St. Elsewhere and there was Mash. Okay. Again, okay. those were medical-based dramas, right. but they they're dramas. Right. So they weren't they weren't real life, but they had real life aspects to it. And if you think that you're deciding that you want to be a doctor because of those programs, right? Then you're not you know you you really need to, to <laughs> go in go into the hospital and learn a little bit more about what right. is going on. Right. Uh, because thank those, God there's not that drama. <laughs> yeah, they have, but those yeah they they have the same it's the same sort of thing. My my father. Um, was he a doctor? He was a lawyer. A oh, lawyer okay. and turned uh, judge in New York State. Okay. And he said to my sister one time when she was, she really loved L.A. law. Yeah. And he, he said to her, law is not L.A. law. Nope. So, and, Big know, disappointment. So it's, it's, just like, it's just like anything else. And right. So there's, there's professions, there's TV shows on uh, policing and fire rescue. Right. And like that. And they're, it's all drama. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of reality to it, but, um, yeah. but it's it's, um, you know, I did like Mash, um, I did like Saint Elsewhere, and all of those shows, and and they, uh, you know, I, there are some scenes from those that I still remember and use as examples of, of what to do. You can learn some things in oh, those yeah? shows because they like, do such as <laughs> converting a. Uh, I remember Howie Mandel was a intern in. St. Elsewhere, I believe it was, that uh, he converted somebody's uh, tachycardia by uh, pushing him over into a bucket of ice water. Huh. And, you know, that, that you can use. Wow. Something like that. Now, that okay. was a dramatic effect. Yeah. But, um, you know, you can convert some cardiac arrhythmias by, you know, putting ice to the face. Huh. So that's what he did. So you know, I, t I tell kids, you were mentioning uh, kids that decide, your, your son who decided to go away from orthopedics and go on the business side. We physicians often say that they took the right path <laughs> uh, because they, you know, you have to really decide why you want to do medicine. Medicine is not for the money. No. There's long hours. There's long, um, and... A lot of in, sacrifices. In the, in the pediatric world, the, the money isn't as good as maybe it is in orthopedics. Right. Um, and uh, when I was applying to or thinking about going into medical school, when I spoke to physicians who were friends of the family, they all said, you need to have your head examined if you want to go into medicine. Okay. And that's, and I hear a, that a lot. And there's a lot of physicians who will say that to kids now. And, and Why? I didn't. Because it's it's a hard life, and it, it takes away why? from <laughs> why is it a hard life? Yeah, it it takes many hours. It takes uh, it take it your take you after sacrifice, a work day. You sacrifice time with your family. Mm -hmm. um, many families don't stay together because of the uh, the, the sacrifices that are that are either not accepted or um, the physician, whoever that be, the the husband or wife, puts in more work yeah. into their job than in the family that and that's in any that's true career path it is so um and that's why maybe it's great that i mean i don't, I don't want to say they have to but it's it's also nice if they're in the same that doesn't field. always work the important thing is 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 the relationship and not necessarily the career path that you're taking thank god we're not so. doing that journey today right. so, <laughs> um, so it's, i mean a, a typical day uh, i i'm mostly clinical in the in the office so it's uh, 8.30 to 5, um, just, you know, seeing patients, and then after that it's doing the paperwork, and the paperwork, can't, if you can't get the, the electronic record 
call it paperwork, but it's electronic record. If you can't get that done with each patient, then it's probably at least another 20 minutes per patient um, in the rest of your night. So you might be working until midnight or so wow. on those charts. Yeah. So and, and different professions have different charting requirements or, or burdens. Um, and uh, so everybody's day is a little bit different. Right. You know, a, a surgeon's notes might be very brief. Uh, some people will hire uh, or maybe they, they have um, a scribe that is a volunteer uh, that works with them. Those volunteers are usually pre-med students who are trying to get hours. So they work on following the physician in the office mm -hmm. and writing down what they talk about and then doing the notes and then the, the physician signs off on that. I don't have that. So they a learn lot of, a lot that well, way a lot of too. ER, a lot of ERs have that. A lot of um, surgeons have PAs. Um, there are nurse practitioners that, that work um, alongside physicians or maybe work as an extender. So if I had a nurse practitioner working with me, mm -hmm. um, I might be able to see 15 patients in a given time. They might be able to see eight or nine, but it would be like me seeing then 23 patients, okay, because I have to sign off on the nurse practitioner's um, notes. And so it's like me working almost double um, mm. and uh, yeah. So they're so are, well no, but they but they're doing some they're doing that work, right? The nurse practitioner is doing that note. So there's there's ways to extend um, your business model um, without, and and more and more we have to find ways to do that because we're getting less and less in return from the payers. Uh, so in order to see more people, you can't create more time. You have to find ways to expand your time, and that's where nurse practitioners and PAs come into play in a lot of uh, programs. And there are people that um, you mentioned, uh, people deciding to become a PA. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked to our daughter about maybe she doesn't want to be a physician, maybe she wants to be a PA. Um, there's better um, life job balance with a PA, I think. Uh, I think I'm not a PA. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Well, what I love about the PA is um, if you were in med school and you already did your residency to be a cardiologist, you can't change that. You'd have to start with a new residency, right? With if as I, far if as if I wanted to change to a different specialty, specialty, sure, yeah. With a PA, they can change and keep changing. They can do ortho one day, cardiology another. They can, yeah, they can. That's do exciting. That. Yeah, that, that's it's interesting that they can do that. Um, yeah, I'm sure they have a lot to learn each but time. But they're they not. They're you know they they eventually will probably find one that segment they like. that they they like and right. want to do uh, because otherwise it's changing their life all the time. And right. I think they most people will find you know and like it depends upon what their again their job life balance they want. They might find that a surg cardiac surgical PA, they're working too hard, there's too many hours, um, whereas some other um, PA psychology or psychiat psychiatric PA, neuro neurology PA, maybe those hours better. I don't know. Okay. Right. And there's different professions in, in medicine where you can be a pediatric cardiologist, now you're going to have, you're going to be on call, there's emergencies, there's middle of the night things, there's lots of hospitals to cover where babies are born, where you might have to go and see a baby. Um, you're working in with cardiac intensive care. Frequently yeah. I do a week, pretty much a week a month in cardiac intensive care where I'm working there along with then I'm doing the, the office the other weeks. Um, and um, so those, those weeks are, are a little bit more challenging. The hours are longer. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, so, but it also adds a little bit more interesting things. But, but there are people who go into dermatology. Hmm. The dermatology doesn't have as many emergencies. Yeah. Okay, so. Well, may, that maybe, depends. Did they get a big pimple on prom night? I mean, correct. you know. <laughs> Every, everyone's life threatening emergency is, is different. But there, there aren't as many emergencies for different specialties. Um. When you do these wonderful runs every year, thanks to Corona, we didn't get to do it this year, but 
You still did it. Yep. So. Got my medal. Look at so, that. Yep. So this is, um, I don't know if this was the 14th or 15th year or of the run. And you often dress up as a superhero because to moms and dads, pediatric cardiologists are superheroes. <laughs> Well, the kid, the kids I are, can tell the kids you that. Are, the kids are the superheroes. Wow. So. You want to show us your cape and uh, what do you wear? <laughs> what I wear? I wear that shirt. <laughs> yes. During a race, he wears this shirt. But well, wait till you see what else he wears. Well, this, is my, yeah, this is my heart hero's cape. And this is actually a, um, a cape. Heart Heroes is the company. And they actually will donate a cape to... Um, it's a, a charitable organization, and, and they will donate capes to people who have had um, congenital heart surgery. Um, and then, you know, you can apply a donation to Heart Heroes uh, in order to support their, their efforts. But any of the children who have congenital heart disease and they have heart surgery can send a note online at huh. heartheroes.org and get a free cape. Wow. And they can wear it. So I, I had heart surgery two and a half years ago for a congenital defect. And um, that wasn't why I went into pediatric cardiology. But, right. Um, but the... Um, the um, how, how do your patients, do you ever tell your patients that you had heart surgery? Sure. Yeah. Does that help? I mean, not that that's a necessity. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if it helps a, a three-year-old. No. The, right. the, the parents, you know, will question me again and say, is that why you went into pediatric right. cardiology? And, and or they'll say, does that make it hard to do, to go into surgery when you are in that profession yourself? And I felt, I felt more at ease because I knew the team that right. took care of me. I didn't use my team, I used the other team at, right. at, at ANOVA, uh, who was uh, recommended to me and they did a great job at home in awesome. a few days. and. Not back to running half marathons yet, but 5Ks. Wow. We'll, we'll get so back to it. so uh, during Corona time, we hear everybody's gaining weight and so forth. <laughs> um, Some people. Yeah, but a lot of people are doing. So you did for this because you know there was no 5K. Um, didn't you go out and just do it with your family and we did. do um, tell us about that? Well, we went to the the normal uh, place, Fairfax Corner, where we hold the race. Right. And we just ran the, the race, the course that day and, and uh, you know, tried to, make it as, <laughs> tried to make it as real as possible. Right. So it was, it was fun, but it was not, so it was not the same. No. No, so other, people, people, other people did their own 5Ks in their, in their area, either walking it or running it, whatever, on treadmill. Um, you just submitted your time for your 5K and, and it was all virtual. Um, and, but it was not the same because normally we have moon bounces and face painting and get to see the kids and there's you know, and a couple, picture, thousand, yeah, booths. couple thousand people there where we get to see, you know, take pictures with them. And, yeah. uh, with, I have families that come from North Carolina and Buffalo, New York and wow. uh, other places to come back for the run and they look, wow. they look forward to seeing me, I look forward to seeing them. And, uh, Told you, superheroes. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 People are grateful. Yes. So it's, as, as I said, it's rewarding. And, and, yeah. uh, and when so is, as it's rewarding to be a doctor, there must be a lot of pressure as well because, let you know, I mean, let's say a mom comes to you with a three-year-old or a baby, you know, five months old or one month old, um, and you're, that, that's got to be a lot of pressure. Yeah, we, we hope that everyone has a good day, the day that... Uh, they need their surgery. I hope everyone's on, you know, had enough coffee, enough sleep. Yeah. You know, so yeah, there's, there's, you know, you always worry about, about the, the children when you're sending them off to surgery, not as much as maybe their parents. Um, so I thought you were a surgeon, but what you do, what all cardiologists do are exams, like... Well, um, cardiologist is, a, is the medical side. Right. So surgeons are the cardiothoracic surgeon. Right. But you also go in to do, um, you do things in the cath lab and things like that. I do supportive things in the cath lab and in the operating room with uh, ultrasound, echocardiography, where we will 
look at the heart before and after surgery to make sure that we have the diagnosis right and then make sure that they've completed the surgery properly afterwards. And sometimes we'll find that the um, that there is a residual defect that the surgeon has to go back on heart lung and bypass and, and fix before going back up to the ICU. Wow. So, so that's a you know it's it's a it's a role that is important. Um, but that's yeah. comforting. That's got to be comforting to the parents to know that you're there also. Right. Sure. Besides yeah. the surgeon that they just met, you know. Well, prior. some some uh, some parents will. The surgeon is key too. Don't get me wrong. Sure. <laughs> Some parents will elect to have the surgery the week that they know I'm in the hospital. And that's, right, right. There, there's a little pressure on that, but it's also yeah. um, it's nice that they feel that they want me around to help take care of their child, but you also want to make sure that I could get overwhelming on the schedule. Great, oh, yeah. So. Superheroes. Yeah, sure. They are superheroes. And uh, they understand mom's crying, dad's crying. <laughs> it's very dramatic. <laughs> So you really have to be uh, Sometimes we geared up. With you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's sad. Yeah. You you really get to know your patients. Your patients really adore you. I've seen that at the races. So you have a big crowd. Yep. So yep. I'm old. I've got a lot. Or any advice you want to give future medical students? It's up to you. What do you want to say to them out there? Well, don't give up on your dream. So if, if your dream is to go to medical school, if your dream is to be a doctor, and, and you know. If it's if it's hopeless, then maybe you know you you can give up on it for a time. But there are other there are other avenues. So people people finish college and go work corporate job for a few years. They've always had a dream that maybe they wanted to be a doctor, and at some point they go, you know, I want to be a doctor. Well, yeah. then you go, you take your prerequisite courses, wow. and then you yeah, it's it's every path is different, but you right. can, you can do it years later. You can right. go work on Wall Street for a few years, make it, uh, tell kids all the time. Go get a business degree, get your, get your, make your, your ton of money. <laughs> get your, yeah, go, go work on Wall Street for a few years, make a ton of money, come back, pay for your medicals. <laughs> so there's one thing that stuck out uh, when we started talking about your medical journey. And we talked about, um, you know, kids were applying to different schools like, oh my gosh, I didn't get in UVA. How am I going to go to med school? And then we were talking about, um, you know, various things. And um, do you remember what you said about what school you went to? I'll give you a hint. So mom comes into the ER. <laughs> that, that was your analogy to tell the kids. Mom comes into the ER and she doesn't say, she says, save my child. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, so you're saying about going <laughs> to what school? Nobody, lo nobody looks at your degree. Right. Anymore. They, they well, I mean, they look at them on the no, wall they when they're don't. in your office. They don't. They, no. It, but it's a conversation piece. Yes. More so than it is a um, uh, a fact checking or right. look, looking at. You know, so you go to undergraduate, go someplace that you're going to get a good, well rounded education to be a good person. Right. A well rounded person. And um, learn if you. If you if you have a specific niche that you want to go into that seems to be um, really kind of specialized and you want to work, you want to make sure you get in that and you find the person who's doing the research in that and you say, okay, that person is at Stanford, then you go there for your medical school. You go there for, you know, you don't go if to you Stanford. Can get in. You know, <laughs> sure, you don't go to, but you don't go to Stanford for undergraduate. You can, right. but you don't have to. You don't have to go to an Ivy League school to right. to get a good residency or to get into a good medical school. Do, those, do some of those things help? Sure, but there's a lot of people now that will look at the well-rounded person who goes to the the smaller um, you know school like I went to, St. Bonaventure University. If people look at my uh, degree from St. Bonaventure University and say, "Oh, great basketball." Yeah. You know, they don't know anything about the school, <laughs> other than that they have a basketball team. Yeah. You know, so people aren't saying. I oh, had that too at St. John's. I went to St. John's. Sure. Yeah, but people. Oh, but how people are the Redmen? I don't know. I'm usually yeah. studying. <laughs> but people aren't saying, "Oh well, gosh, did they have a good biology degree?" They they assume that I must have yeah. gotten the background in order to go to medical school. Well, so. what you said was 
a mom comes into the ER and she doesn't say before she asks you to save her child, she says, save my child. She doesn't say, where did you go to school? Right. <laughs> right. She assumes that ANOVA has a great cardiologist standing there. Right. Or whatever hospital. Now they might say that afterwards. Yeah. After, after the after the trauma and the drama of the initial uh, evaluation, they might. How they might often though? No, it's, often. It's, it's more casual. Uh, just in okay. conversation. Yeah. You, you might talk about. You know, they might yeah. see your your uh, diplomas on the wall. Oh yeah. Later yeah. on, and they you know, so as they get to know you. Yeah. As you're taking care of their child, they they learn more about you and where you went. And that's where they start saying, "Oh, the Bonnie's great. They a great, great basketball bobbling here." You know? <laughs> so the older you are, the more that they know from early '70s. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's very rare. And Bonaventure was a, a school that had about 2,000 students per uh, per four years. Wow. So 500 a year. Um, wow. And. Um, so it's pretty small, but yeah. a lot of people know people who went there, or they know the story of St. Bonaventure University because it's it's a great school, great. well rounded people. There's a lot of people in in the Washington D.C. area in uh, corporate leadership uh, roles that were St. Bonaventure graduates, and uh, so there's they they you know build a well rounded um, person. Right. And uh, and you then go off to wherever you want to go for your master's in business education or you know you know whatever in business administration or accounting and whatever else that you go. So you don't right. don't have to go there, and, and then you can go to the Wharton School of Business afterwards. And there's all sorts of opportunities. Well, Dr. Callahan, I think uh, they have a pretty good idea about your journey. Is there are there any last words you want to say about your journey? Not really. I mean, I think, as I said, just don't give up on your journey if it's if it's your ultimate dream. There's there's different paths that you can take, and uh, you you have to. It's your work ethic has to be strong. Your uh, your commitment has to be strong. Uh, you can't be driven by the dollar, or you'll be disappointed. Yeah. Uh, you have to be driven by uh, caring for people, and in in my role, I'm caring for people that I know that I'm trying to bring into adult life that can have a normal superhero 70 80 years of life right. you know and I that's the hope uh, some of them won't make it to that and others will others will do better than we thought they would from the, from the get-go I've got kids that I take care of right now who are doing amazing things and years ago there was nothing offered for them. Mm -hmm. Well that's great so that I, we've come so far. Yeah. yeah. The first pacemaker, the person who had the pacemaker pushed it down the hall. Oh my god. Okay, so then they became smaller and smaller. Now they can be a silver dollar size and it can be underneath your muscle. Right. Uh, and defibrillate. Wait, how would they push a pace the pacemakers inside them? No, the wires came out and that was oh. the first pacemaker. It was like oh, a, wow. it was like pushing a, a, a cart with a battery on it. Oh, okay. So those were those were the early. I mean, that's the wow. early stuff. We've come so far. Yeah. yeah. So now it's it's much. It's kind of like, you know, when you needed a a heart lung uh, pump or a heart pump. Yeah. Um, you know, it used to be on Grey's Anatomy. You'd see the person had a whole machine next to them, and then yeah. you had then it, then it became miniaturized where. Right. It might be sitting outside of them. Now they can be inside, and the tubes might come out. And there, you put it in a backpack. You know, so things things have become more and more miniaturized. Well, thank you, Dr. You're Callahan. Welcome. To all you HOSA students out there, good luck. I hope Dr. Callahan's answers and information have helped you during this time of the unknown. Um, our prayers are with you and your family, and let's not get COVID. And teenagers, let's be. Careful. I know it's been going on forever. It's not going to be forever. Let's not end it with a funeral. Let's end it with big parties. Let's just follow the rules, wear our masks, and keep our distance. We can still party. Wash your hands. Bye. And wash your hands, Dr. Callahan said.